Welcome to this session of literary criticism, where we would be looking into Brooke's analysis of paradox in Alexander Pope's An Essay on Man, Epistle 2. In our previous session, we had looked into the employment of paradox or the analysis of paradox by Brooks in William Wordsworth. Now, let us see what Brooks has to say about Alexander Pope's An Essay on Man, Epistle 2. Neoclassical poetry also abounds in paradox, in contrast to the romantics whose use of paradox rests on wonder, the use of paradox by the neoclassics depends on irony. Brooks cites an extract from Alexander Pope's poem, An Essay on Man, Epistle 2. I quote the lines, In doubt his mind or body to prefer, born but to die, and reasoning but to err. Alike in ignorance his reason such, whether he thinks too little or too much, created half to rise and half to fall. Great Lord of all things, yet a prey to all sole judge of truth in endless error hurled, the glory, jest and riddle of the world. Pope here treats common objects such as man to awaken man to see himself in a new light, which is blinding too. The poem suggests that man is a creature that is confused whether he has to follow the dictates of his mind or senses. Man is born to die and his reasoning is often erroneous. He is capable of thinking, but treats both arrogance and the capacity to reason with the same magnitude. Man was created by God and kept in an exalted position, but he fell into the abyss of despair. Man considers himself to be the best of God's creation, but he falls prey to everything he controls in turn becoming a slave of that entire he owns. Man claims to be the epitome of truth, but he is prone to commit errors. Man, God's creation is indeed the glory, joke and puzzle that the world has ever seen. Just as one gets a tinge of irony implied in Wordsworth's sonnets, in Pope's poetry there is a touch of awe and wonder. We move on to see how Brooks analyzes paradox in Coleridge and Gray. In the poems of Wordsworth and Pope, irony and wonder never occur simultaneously. Yet, in the lyrics of Blake and Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, irony and wonder merge together. Similar to Wordsworth, Gray broods over the fate of the peasants against a pastoral setting in his elegy written in a country churchyard. The elegy, steeped in paradox, is more inclined towards irony than wonder. Brooks quotes the following quatrain to show irony and justifies that, I quote, the paradoxes spring from the very nature of the poet's language. It is a language in which the connotations play as great a part as the denotations." Unquote. Let us now move on to the quatrain. Can storied urn or animated bust, back to its mansion called the fleeting breath? Can honour's voice provoke the silent dust, or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death? Gray asks two questions. First, whether an urn that contains a dead person's remains or the bust would be able to infuse life into the dead person. The dead person's body is a mansion and the speaker personifies the urn and the bust asking if they can call the dead person's breath back to the mansion of their body. Second, the speaker personifies honour and asks if it can provoke the silent, dusty remains of a dead person to speak again or whether flattery can make the cold ear of death feel better about being dead. Honour, flattery and death are personified. The answer to these questions is obviously no. The point that Brooks develops is that 
The poet never uses notation like a scientist, but within his limits, he gives literary color to his language while composing a poem. Let us now move into what Brooks has to say about the differences between the languages of science and poetry. He observes that scientific language containing notations is essentially prone to fix and freeze the terms and words into exact denotation. Whereas, the poetic language is disruptive, the poetic terms and diction continuously modify each other violating their denotative meaning. T. S. Eliot in Philip Massinger comments that there is, I quote him, a perpetual slight alteration of language, words perpetually juxtaposed in new and sudden combinations, unquote, in poetry. This verbal process is continuous and becomes the nature of a poem. It is a perpetual part of the craft of poetry and cannot be kept out, but can only be directed and controlled. Unlike the scientist, the poet directs and controls the meaning of words according to his own inclination, disturbing normal meanings. Brooks argues that it is important to develop a critical faculty to evaluate how the poetic language works, to express the subtler states and shades of emotion the poet employs metaphors. It is however, not possible that the metaphors would fit on the same plane. This makes the continual tilting of the planes an immediate necessity. The denotative meaning is violated by qualification and the analogy is a tool with which the poet proceeds with his work. Scientific language is direct and functions like a notation. The method of art is never direct, but always indirect. Brooks quotes Shakespeare's figure from Hamlet to explain his point. I quote, with essays of bias by indirections and directions out, unquote. Even the most simple and straightforward poet is forced into paradoxes by the nature of his instrument. The main task of the poet is to employ paradox consciously to gain verbal compression and precision, which is otherwise unobtainable. The poet is not defeated by this task and the poem is not reduced to shallow sophistry. The method is an extension of the normal language of poetry, not a perversion of it. The device of paradox enables the poet to say what direct statements could never convey. The poet liberates the terms from the stabilizing influence of scientific thinking, allowing them to escape into unexpected connotational novelties. After analyzing paradox in Wordsworth and the others like Coleridge and Gray, Brooks moves on to analyze paradox in metaphysical poetry. Brooks demonstrates that paradox is specially brought into play as a central device in metaphysical poetry. John Donne in his collection named John Donne Paradoxes and Problems written in prose exploits paradox skillfully in the canonization. Brooks interprets the poem in detail to show paradox to be the pivotal structure of the poem. The poem contains a metaphor in the form of paradox which is reflected in the title of the poem. Dunn treats the profane love of the two lovers as if it was a divine love of a pair of hermits who renounced worldly desires and pleasures. The two lovers, who are steadfast in their love, consider their body to be a hermitage. They sacrifice everything for the sake of love and they are regarded as saints. The fantastic comparisons made in the poem carry forward the idea of the sanctity of worldly love and the 
the basic metaphor of the saint is carried on till the end of the poem. The likening of the lovers to the phoenix that rises from its ashes could be compared to love that remains alive even after death. This seems to parody both love and religion, but in fact it combines them pairing unlikely circumstances and demonstrating their resulting complex meaning. Brooks points to secondary paradoxes in the poem, the concomitant duality and singleness of love and the double and contradictory meanings of die in metaphysical poetry that are used to denote both consummation of the act of love and death. The poet urges that their love is not mundane that rests on lust, hence the lovers can afford to reject the world. The complete effect is sustained by the assertion and realization of the lovers that the well wrought urn, a pretty room would hold the lovers ashes and would not suffer against the half acre tomb of the prince. Brooks contends that it is only through paradox that these several meanings could be accurately conveyed with the right depth and emotion for any other direct method would have abated the seriousness of what was said. Deprived of the character of paradox and accompanied by irony and wonder, the nature of love described in the poem would have lost its power and glory and reduced to mere facts. The problem of unity is discussed in the sense that the lovers become one just as a soul is united with God. This way one type of union becomes the metaphor for the other. The sense of union is born out of creative imagination. The poem is characterized by a modulation of tone, accurate dramatization, ironical tenderness and the use of brilliant paradox. A similar paradox is used in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet when Juliet says I quote for saints have hands that pilgrims hands do touch and palm to palm in holy palmer's kiss unquote. Let us analyze paradox in Coleridge and Shakespeare. Coleridge employs a series of paradoxes in his classic description of the nature and power of paradox. In this connection Brooks says that the paradox employed by Coleridge reveals itself in the balance or reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities of sameness with difference of the general with the concrete, the idea with the image, the individual with the representative, the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects, a more than usual state of emotion with more than usual order. Shakespeare's The Phoenix and the Turtle proves that nature is simple and unified. However, the difficulty of resolving the double entities was intensified since Shakespeare's time when reason had in it self confounded by the union of the phoenix and the turtle. This state is resolved by paradox that wraps up the poem with its startling conclusion. The urn which holds the ashes of the phoenix also holds the ashes of the phoenix lovers in the poem itself. This urn is similar to with Keats urn which contains truth and beauty as well as Shakespeare's urn which held beauty, truth and rarity. In a sense all such urns contain the ashes of a phoenix. The phoenix rises from its ashes for the acceptance of the paradox of the imagination itself. Else beauty, truth and rarity will remain enclosed in their cinders and all that will be available for our pains would be the cinders. Brooks concludes his essay 
by saying that the poem, the canonization, epitomizes the theory of structure in which paradox seeks a formula or category to identify the special character of literary language. Brooks is aware of the tendency of modern man who can hardly comprehend the paradoxical, ironical and indirect language of poetry because he is habituated into I quote an easy yes or no. Modern man refuses to accept the paradox as a serious rhetorical device and since he is able to accept it only as a cheap trick he is forced into this dilemma unquote. Let us look into the other aspects related to Brooks concept of paradox. In literature paradox refers to a literary device that indulges in the anomalous juxtaposition of incompatible ideas for the sake of an unexpected revelation. An analysis of paradox in a work of art would examine the contradictory statements made and draw inferences either to reconcile the opposites or to harmonize them. Brooks however reiterates that paradox is essential to the structure of a poem. In the effort to show how paradox is inevitable to poetic meaning, Brooks asserts that paradox is quite similar to poetry. In this connection, the new critic Leroy Seal is of the opinion that, I quote him, the form of the poem uniquely embodies its meaning, unquote, and the language of the poem effects the reconciliation of opposites or contraries. Irony functions within the poem, but paradox encompasses the meaning as well as the structure of the poem which includes irony. The prevalence of opposites or contraries and their reconciliation constitutes poetry and the meaning of the poem. Brooks insistence that the poetic language is the language of paradox explains that he refuses to look at things as they are. The metaphors he uses in his criticism provide evidence that his criticism of poetry is complex. The use of complex metaphors in his poetry reflects his theory of poetry which could be enumerated as the first to integrate the well wrought urn to a poem is the extensive meaning of the image in Dunn's the canonization. The metaphor of the urn parallels the metaphor of hermitage which implies the lover's domination over the world. Second, the image of the urn merges with the image of the phoenix. The phoenix would rise from its ashes and this entails that love supersedes passion and will remain forever. Third, the paradoxes inherent in the metaphor of the urn in Dunn's poem relate with certain aspects of Brooke's poetic theory. First, poetry is not practical or utilitarian, but it is intimately linked with life and deals with the experiences of human beings. Poetry is the outcome of the united feeling of oneness, but human life is transient. This is a paradox in the relation between poetry and reality. Second, the metaphor of Urn Phoenix denotes Brooke's opinion about the value of poetry. He proposes the structural unity of all poems. It is in this structure that the value and critical standards stay alive or exist. Of course, Brooke's centrality of paradox was not without criticism. Let us now look into the criticism of Brooke's importance of paradox. The Chicago critic R. S. Crane in his essay, The Critical Monism of Client Brooks, vehemently opposes Brooke's centrality of paradox. Brooks is unconcerned 
about the intricacies of imagination and the latent power of the poets to create works of lasting impression. Brooks assigned imagination the role of being able to reconcile opposites or entities of divergent qualities. Brooks ignores the pleasure aspect that the poem can impart and focuses only on poetry as the manifestation of truth. Crane says that Brooks does not indulge in assessing the role of paradox in everyday discourse that includes scientific discussions which is opposed to poetry. Crane claims that Brooks definition of poetry reveals that the most powerful paradoxical poem in modern history would be Einstein's formula E is equal to mc square which is itself paradoxical in that matter and energy are considered to be the same thing. The argument for the centrality of paradox and irony therefore becomes reductio ad absurdum which means that Brooks argument is refuted as being absurd and paradox ends as an ineffective tool for literary analysis. Let us recapitulate what we have done so far in this session. Brooks concludes his essay The Language of Paradox by emphasizing that paradox is central to poetry. The study of literature entails considering a work of art to be a self-sufficient artifact. Pope, Gray, Coleridge, Shakespeare and Dunn have effectively used paradox to reveal complexities in meanings inherent in words. Paradox serves as a tool to unearth covert meanings that are crucial to poetry as well as identify Brooks theory of poetry. In Brooks use of the paradox as a tool for analysis, he develops the idea to link literary technique with strong emotional effect. We do have questions for you to answer that will help you understand Brooks concept of poetry. Until we meet the next session with further ideas on what critics or theorists have to say about their theory, this is me taking my time off. Thank you.